Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit. I'm so happy you all are here tonight. My name is Jova, and I am a Ford Foundation Curatorial Fellow here at MOCAD, as well as a co-curator of the exhibition Crossing Night, Regional Identities, Global Context. Uh, thank you here for being here for the third program we have in our States of Flux series that highlights local thinkers, uh, local and regional thinkers, creatives, art historians and critics um, in sort of intersecting with themes in the exhibition. So thank you all so much. Uh, to, before we get started, I want to thank our amazing partners, both on the exhibition and the States of Flux programming, uh, such as A4 Foundation for Art, the Wedge Collection, big shout out to the Wedge Collection, uh, the National Endowment for the Arts and University of Michigan Stamps. Um, so I'm just here to tell you a little bit about our speakers tonight and then we'll get started. Uh, first up, Samantha Knoll is an assistant professor of art history at Wayne State University. She received her BA in fine art from Brooklyn College and her MA and PhD in art history from Duke University. Her research interests revolve around history of art, visual culture, and performance of the black diaspora. She has published on, a, on black modern and contemporary art and performance in journals, such as Small Acts, Third Text, and Art Journal. Uh, her current book manuscript, Tropical Aesthetics of Black Modernism, under contract with Duke University Press, examines black modernism in the early 20th century, particularly how tropicality functioned as a unifying element in the African diasporic art and performance. Next up, we have Dr. Kenneth Montague. Dr. Kenneth Montague is a Toronto-based dentist, as well as an art collector and founder and director of the Wedge Collection uh, and the Wedge Collection Curatorial Projects, a non-for-profit non arts organization that helps promote African-Canadian artists. Since 1997, Ken has been exhibiting contemporary art that explores black identity and showcasing these works in his Wedge Collection. Montague has been a member of the AGO Board of Trustees since 2015, and he is currently chair of the Education and Communi Communication Committee. Uh, I should also say that this is the second exhibition that Kenneth Montague and the Wedge Collection have collaborated on with MOCAD, and we're so happy to be doing this. The first time was 10 years ago, so it's a celebration for us as an institution. Uh, next up, we have Michael Stone Richards, a critical theorist uh, who at both CCS full-time professorship, as well as the critical theorist in residence at Cranbrook Academy of Art for this semester. Uh, Michael Stone Richard is an avid writer and is also the editor of the Detroit Research uh, publication, which looks at different types of art forms through, through research perspectives. Um, and we are gonna be hearing a lot from our, my co-curator, collaborator, colleague, uh, Suzanne Hilberry, senior curator here at MOCAD, Larry Osimensa. So thank you all for being here tonight and enjoy. Thank you, Jova. Thank you everybody for being here. Uh, thank you, Samantha, Ken, Michael. Uh, so we're gonna jump right into it. Uh, we wanna aim to keep this conversation free flowing um, and talking with everybody uh, up here, you know, really interested in, you know, their personal perspective in addition to their professional perspective when we think about this idea of black art as cultural archive. Um, and, you know, I'll kind of start it off and then I think we'll, we'll get it going, but you know, the first question that I have is, you know, what does the cultural archive mean? Um, and I think for me, working on this exhibition with Jova and Josh, um, that understanding has really shifted. Because um, I've, you know, viewed the archive previously doing this show as something that was dead and dormant, 
um, something that you know you would envision to be in the basement of somebody's library. Um, but through working on this exhibition, um, I came to understand it's very much alive, very much contemporary. It's very much about um, time stamping a cultural contribution, particularly when you're thinking about uh, individuals from the African diaspora. Um, some would say validating our cultural contribution. And so uh, for me, my hope at the end of this conversation is that you think about uh, what can you do to contribute uh, to the cultural archive that, you know, whether it's related to your personal life, your cultural life, or the Detroit uh, community. Um, so with that being said, I will start with Samantha and then we'll keep it flowing. We, we are friends here. So what, what, is, what does the cultural archive mean to you as an art historian um, teaching at Wayne State, um, from Trinidad, but living in Detroit? Um, how do you think about this, this idea, this notion? Thank you, Larry. Um, so I mean, certainly as an academic, you know, thinking about the, um, the academy and the importance of producing knowledge, of archiving knowledge, right, um, collecting information that could be, um, you know, like you kept and stored and, and for, for reference, right, across time, across generations. I mean, that it, it certainly, when we think of the, the word, it does, um, I think, connote uh, um, or is very much connected to a, like a, a Eurocentric like view of like how information could be um, yeah, you know, stored and preserved and saved, but certainly thinking beyond the academy and beyond the ivory tower, I think when I recall, recollect a, a lot of the research that I've done about the black experience throughout the, the black diaspora and throughout the Americas, I think um, the, cultural, the cultural archive, the archive really is in many ways an embodied experience Right, um, that doesn't necessarily have to be a material object or thing, or right, that is, you know, some written words, right? Um, but something that is, yeah, could be corporeally expressed, vocally expressed, um, passed on, like like we were discussing earlier with with that this tradition of oral history, right? Passed on from generation to generation, but it's also a means of, I think survival, sustenance, um, perseverance, um, a means of, I guess, a, a counter discourse, right, to the, you know, the, the established order, right, um, politically, socially, and, you know, when thinking about, you know, during the era of slavery, colonization, the Jim Crow era in the US, colonization in the Caribbean and Latin America and Africa, right? Um, but it really, yeah, that's, I, when I think of cultural archive, that's what I think about, um, this alternative means of, um, yeah, finding um, a form of self-validation, self-determination, yeah. Just to piggyback, you talk about survival. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And then I think also, specifically art as a tool or a mechanism to survive, to cope, to thrive? Yeah, uh, uh, I think that for people of African descent, you know, um, in case you hear an accent, yes, I'm from the Caribbean, I'm from Trinidad, but, you know, thinking about my ancestors who were enslaved Africans, right, on plantations throughout the Caribbean, um, the Southern Caribbean specifically, uh, you know, it. it I think the, the, the various ways in which they purposely disobeyed laws and found ways to keep their heritage and culture alive, you know, during the traumatic, horrific institution of slavery. I think that's specifically what I mean about survival, right? And even, um, you know, after the abolition of slavery and, um, you know, moving into the, you know, the late 19th to early 20th century and other parts of the Black Atlantic, right? Um, yeah, I mean, even if it meant, you know, um, getting up in the middle of the night, going and very hard to reach spaces and places and locations where you could practice your culture and 
you know, continue, you know, continue creating a, a form of heritage, right, that we in the present moment could look back upon and, and claim and recognize as our own, right, something that is very much rooted in our, in our history, a sense of ancestry. So yeah, that's, that's what I mean about survival for, you know, um, during that historical moment in the past, but certainly I think even today, right, for people of African descent who are living in various parts of, of, the, of the Americas, or even in, in, in Europe, right? Yeah, so that's what I mean. Mr. Montague from Windsor, right across. Um, can you give us your thoughts, particularly with relationship to um, Wedge? You know, why did you think creating Wedge will be a vehicle to be part of this, I guess, cultural stewardship, or as a vehicle of cultural stewardship? And then also, I guess, are there any things that you see different in Canada or similarities with regard to just black identity, black art, the culture, the idea of the cultural archive? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Larry. Um, I, I, I got it. Before I forget, I really need to acknowledge something uh, tonight. Uh, uh, it is a return for me. I was born and grew up in Windsor. My parents were from Jamaica. My dad went to Wayne State University. We ended up living across the river. And my earliest experiences with art were at the Detroit Institute of Arts, at the Detroit Historical Society, the public library, seeing those murals. And um, so it's very, uh, you know, it's a very personal thing, you know, coming here always. Uh, living in Toronto over many years, I still call Windsor and Detroit home. So it's a thrill to be back at MoCAD. Uh, and we did a show almost 12 years ago now, and I have to acknowledge Pamela Edmonds, who's here tonight, because Pamela uh, wrote beautifully for our show called Becoming a Decade Ago, and there is a new catalog that just has been released for this show, and Pamela wrote for that, so thank you, Pamela, for making the journey. Thank you so much. Um, and to answer you, Larry, um, you know, I was, I'm, I guess you could see I'm a minimalist. I've always been a minimalist, but I, I got a new take on the archive and the meaning of an archive, seeing a show more than a decade ago now from uh, my old friend, uh, the late curator, uh, Oquian Wazer, who did that great show, Archive Fever, at, um, in the um, International Center for Photography in New York. And I remember you know, it was just more is more, you know? It was like uh, Lorna Simpson and collages and images and over here was Zoe Leonard and he was just pulling together so many artists with so many stories. So I realized it really resonated with me because the archive's about storytelling for me and it's about that, that tradition of storytelling, um, you know, that survived the Black Atlantic journeys and like this, this idea of um, talking about uh, you know, the oral tradition and keeping things alive. Um, and you're right, it's beyond just something physical or even spoken, it's a spiritual thing. So the archive for me is uh, on almost a metaphysical level, you know. So, you know, as a collector, that's funny to say because I'm so much about, you know, material work, I have to collect this and this, but I think about that as a guiding principle. It's about the idea what goes with what uh, about sameness and difference, not so much about this uh, kind of uh, black experience that everyone wants to say is sort of this way. It's about the many ways that we think about being black. And, and that's really something that I've had to think about in a visceral way, being a black Canadian. And I know Pam knows this. You know, we're truly a minority in Canada and it's, you know, the, Black population in Canada is less than one percent, and uh, which you know changes a lot in maybe an urban center like Toronto. But growing up in Windsor, I was like an island, you know. And so for me, putting together images uh, that kind of made me kind of um, think about uh, my black identity in in so many different ways. Thinking about the many ways that our people kind of survived and thrived. Like that for me was, was survival. Like I needed that, it wasn't on a platter for me. Like my cousins in Jamaica who, you know, grew up in a black culture, like it, for me it was like, I had to piece the story together. So collecting became this sort of vehicle, this means of 
storytelling and oh yeah, this happened here and that happened there and it was a corrective for growing up here in Windsor, Detroit with American television at the time with you know, all those sitcoms like What's Happening in Sanford and Son and you know, we joked around about it but you know, no one in my family thought that we live like this. It was always kind of like that's someone else's vision of black culture. I know there's something else. It was always this search for the many stories. So the archive, this collecting drive for me is about, you know, kind of trying to put together something around identity and then kind of be able to really, you know, make a world for myself in a way. So can you talk a little bit more about the multiple views of blackness or black identity? Because we were talking earlier um, sometimes there's this desire, which rightly so at times, to make this distinction between Caribbean, African American, Afro Canadian, African American. Um, You're a continental brother, yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, how do you, um, I guess both of you and then Michael, you could jump in. How do you think about that? Do you make a distinction? Um, do you think about them as the same? Because I think that also sometimes functions as a, a, a divisive tool. Because like I saw something in the, the Times where they were talking about this group, Eidos, um, African descendants of slaves, and trying to like make this separation. And so I guess how can we use art, you know, music, culture as a tool to kind of show that there is a, a continuum? Obviously, it's not apples and apples. I mean, well, as I said, we're all the same. Yeah. We're, we're fruit from the same tree, True. so to speak. So I guess, how do you think about that through your work? How have um, you seen that kind of? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question and a good thought. Um, I think uh, growing up so close to America, uh, there was always this sense of uh, this overwhelmingly uh, rich and kind of um, culturally diverse African-American kind of uh, presence, but you know, it, it was probably music more than anything that gave me the sort of sense that, hey, we have something else going on in Canada where, you know, there is a, and I'll use hip hop as an example. I grew up in an era, I'm old enough to remember the birth of hip hop and visiting cousins in the 80s when I was a kid in New York and, you know, seeing, you know, parties and how this thing evolved. But we had this separate evolution in Canada where because so many of the black folks in Canada, uh, you know, emigrated from the Caribbean, you know, we have this other strain of hip hop, uh, artists like Cardinella Fishal and, you know, uh, Michi Mi that have this sort of a uh, hybrid Caribbean, you know, reggae and, and uh, Calypso infused sort of thing. So that always to me was like the metaphor, like we have something in common, of course, and we've all shared that, you know, we have that legacy of slavery that keeps us bonded. But I, I have to say, and I think maybe Michael can speak more about this, but I actually feel more kinship with the black British experience than the black American experience. And in a lot of ways, that's because of that Commonwealth thing, Canada, the Caribbean, Jamaica was a British colony until, you know, just, yeah, 62. I was born in the 60s, so, you know, yeah, 60, 62, I think, Jamaica independence. So, I mean, you know, it just became its own country, you know, pretty much in my lifetime. And I think all that God save the Queen business, for better or worse, mostly worse, uh, really kind of, kind of penetrated my consciousness and my family. And I think the oppression and the fight against that particular colonial you know, battle is something that rings true. When I, when I started collecting work from black British artists, Van Lee Burke and Joy Gregory and others, it really spoke to me about something that I could feel maybe more than, despite the proximity, more than a black American experience. So that, again, tells you it's not the same thing. I, I'm gonna pass it over to Michael because I know he can talk a little bit more about this. Yeah. Um, is this connected? Good. I mean, first thing I'd like to say how Forgive me, I, 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 I came back via a flight from Dallas a couple of nights ago, and I, lo I lo left my voice in Dallas, um, <laughs> which I think was a protest. Um, the, let me first by saying how very happy I am to be here, and what an amazing show. 
um, Larry and Jova have put together with, with Ken. Um, black art as cultural archive, I, I want to say just maybe just put in a, couple, a few quick comments. Um, the, the great British, black British filmmaker John O'Confra, uh, who regards his practice as a practice of the archive, um, famously said when he realized that the archive would become part of his practice, and I want to have, say a little bit more later about the use of the term practice. When he said that, when he realized that the archive would become his practice, he wanted to find images of black British, African diaspora, quote, that was not a sociological problem, right? He wanted to find images of blackness where blackness was not being treated as a sociological problem. And of course, immediately that meant that he had a lot of work to do to go and find such images. But it also implied certain things such as, for example, a quest for black intimacy, um, uh, a quest for blackness at play, blackness at leisure, and so forth. And one of the things that I find really compelling, and a confra belongs to the same generation of black British experimental filmmakers as Isaac Julian. Um, one of the things that I find compelling in this context is that the model for the archivist practice was found in a white English guy, a man called Philip Donnellan, who made an extraordinary sort of 50 minute documentary in 1964 called The Colony, which was virtually, it was about um, black Im immigrants from the West Indies and some from the Indian subcontinent to Birmingham in England. And Birmingham in England, for those of you who may not know, Birmingham is the exact equivalent of Detroit. That is to say, it's the car capital of the, of, the of the United Kingdom. And people migrated there from the West Indies for purposes of work in a comparable way in which African Americans from the south of the United States migrated to Detroit for work. So Philip Donnellan made this movie where you do not see Philip Donnellan at all. You do not hear Philip Donnellan pose any questions. You simply, the camera is recording black West Indians in England talking amongst themselves, um, praying, um, very famous scene, uh, a, a religious scene towards the end, talking about love. In fact, one of the most important themes in that is not only love amongst the community, but why is it that they do not love us? It's an extraordinary film. So I think it's really important that when a confrer realizes that his practice is going to be the archive, it's, and, and what I'm getting at, Ken, is that these things become quickly complicated because it's actually not immediately a black source that gives him the model of what he's to do. The other thing I want to put on the table is that when we talk about black art as a cultural archive, what else would it be? What else could black art be? And I suppose we want to say it could be many other things, but let's think about it as an archive. And here, my critical theory hat. I want to put on my hat because the title of Okwe and Weezer's great show, Archive Fever, was taken from a, a, a great book by the French philosopher Jacques Derrida, um, uh, Mal d'Archive, uh, Archive Fever. And Derrida is one of the reasons that we're talking about the archive. And the other person is Michel Foucault. Uh, those two people in the 1960s created the idea, the concept of the archive. And one of the things that's really important, why, and I said a moment ago, I'll come back to this term practice, is that they were very clear, and I want to talk mostly about Foucault, is that the archive is not archives. They only ever speak of the archive and not physical archives. And the reason for that, Foucault is easier to, to make this point, is that the archive is not a collection in Foucault and Derrida. The archive is a practice, right? It's not a collection of images. 
So let me explain it like this before I move on, um, we move on. Every culture has practices of memory. There is no culture, you can't have a culture unless you have practices of preserving memory. But not every culture has a practice of the archive in the way that I'm speaking of here. So, of course, if you have an empire, you need to have a bureaucracy, right? Whether, you know, whether it's a Chinese empire, whether it's a Japanese empire, or a British empire, Roman, you need to have a bureaucracy. This is not to do with the practice of memory. Um, so, the archive is immediately, then, not only about inclusion, what is included, the archive is what is the principle of what is included, and more importantly, what is the principle of exclusion? And I think I'd like to put on the table here the way in which, the, one of the ways in which the archive became such an important concept um, for artists as well as theorists, um, beginning in the 70s, 80s, was not simply that it was now let us retrieve things from pasts that have been in some way obfuscated. But now let us look at the principles of power that get at what not only what is included, but for our purposes, more importantly, what is excluded. So that when John O'Comfra, as a young black British of Ghanaian descent, could say, I wanted to find images of blackness that were not, where blackness was not a sociological problem. So there, the archive is not just recovery, but is what is the political principle of exclusion? And I think that for me, the title makes sense, not just as here is a collection, because no collection can ever be comprehensive, but rather what, what are, when we look, how might we also understand what is excluded as well? That would be my initial take on the archive there. Wow, dissertation. <laughs> um, but I want to pick you back on your point in terms of the examples you gave us, because we, well, Samantha and I talked earlier, how can we further think about, if we're particularly focusing on the African diaspora, other ways of archiving that aren't from a Western tradition? You know, so. I, thinking about being from of West African parentage, thinking about oral histories, folklore, a variety of storytelling. Um, I'm interested in how can we focus on those traditions and center those, those traditions and not to negate, you know, Foucault and, and those amazing thinkers, but are there other examples or salient examples for you guys of non-Western ways of archiving, time stamping, um, storytelling, however you want to frame it? The art historian? Anybody? Well, uh, you go ahead, go ahead. For me, the, the thing is, uh, Larry, the, it's not that Foucault or Derrida are Western. It is the archive, if, Every culture has practices of memory, mm -hmm. but not every practice of memory is an archive in this sense. Mm -hmm. So archives can't be collection. Foucault and Derrida, it's not that they are Western. What they enable us to see is the archive has built into it not only a principle of inclusion, mm -hmm. but a principle of exclusion. So for me now to, to think in this way is not quote, let's think about Foucault and Derrida, is to say, okay, um, the, that stunning image that um, um, when we, I, I came on your tour after the exhibition opened uh, of the, the, um, the non-binary person. Oh, Ati. Ati, the, the non-binary, looking, yeah. looking, looking into the mirror, right? So, this is about a politics of visibility. Mm -hmm. That's the archive. This is about a politics of exclusion. That's the archive. So I, I, what I'm saying is that we need to distinguish between practices of memory and practices where inclusion and exclusion 
inevitably become a function of power. That is what Foucault and Derrida enable us to look at. And, we, and so now when we go back into at his South African context, the South African constitution, as you know, which is one of the most progressive constitutions there is, uh, guarantees equal rights uh, for all gender identities. But that does not guarantee visibility for all identities. And or so, safety for that matter. Also, and, and, and the point being, can and safety for that matter. So that work now, if we look at that in one sense of the archive, namely, what is this practice doing in relation to a politics of inclusion, exclusion, that is different from simply at the same time saying, oh, we want to memorialize, right? I don't see primarily the archive in terms of memorialization, but of course, it's difficult not to go that route first before one can get at, oh, we can't include everything. It's simply physically impossible to include everything. So what principle, any principle that we use will automatically have something to do with power. So that's the insight. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether it's in you know, a Yoruba context uh, in Nigeria or whether it's in uh, a Han context in, say, China, right? They're, the archive will automatically exclude. And that's the interest here that we're getting at. But yes, we can talk memorialization as well. Did you have something? Oh, I just would add, you know, to answer your question, just uh, there are just a multitude, an explosion of um, local collectives. And I see this in Detroit, I see this in Toronto, I see this in London, I see this in Kingston, Jamaica. Um, you know, well, think of an artist, uh, a global artist like Dawit Petros, you know, born in Eritrea, grew up in Western Canada in the prairies, went to school in Montreal in the French-speaking part of Canada, goes to do graduate work in Boston, now lives between Chicago, Montreal, New York, you know, just someone who's sort of, uh, you know, leading the life of a contemporary artist. But think of the storytelling and what he can contribute to the archive. He has this great project with another artist, uh, the Black Athena uh, Collective. and. You know, that's just an example of one. In, in Toronto, there are, you know, many. Uh, the BOW, the Black Artists Union, you know, all, all these movements and collectives that are adding to the archive. And, and I, for me, again, I see it through a lens of storytelling, and it's all kind of going in this big cauldron, this pot that's sort of just, you know, we got to keep the flame on it to just keep the stuff boiling and going. I, I feel very... You know, uh, you know, alive when I think about uh, kind of where we're at now versus even 20 years ago, because I've been collecting for about 20 years and I see the difference in terms of, uh, especially with young people, in terms of a certain awareness of the importance, the significance of, um, you know, keeping that story alive. So I kind of, I have a lot of hope and I didn't in the past, but I have more hope actually now uh, that we're in a place where you know, things will not be forgotten. And I feel this a lot in, you know, uh, the, the kind of movement lately of kind of this, this action, this act of remembering, having to um, go back and, and, you know, kind of tell the, the fuller story about, say, contemporary art. Many artists who I've been championing for years are suddenly getting a lot of attention uh, by collectors, by curators, by institutions. And I, it's, it's, you know, it's angering that it took so long, but it's important that we're in a moment where, you know, people are not just obsessed with moving forward, which is kind of the way our society is sort of set up, but that we are actively resisting and going back and saying we need to uh, kind of get something right that, you know, that really wasn't being told in a way that was inclusive before. So I feel like the archive is kind of gaining from not just where we're at in the future, but from the past. It's kind of getting fuller and the storytelling is uh, richer. So I, I'm, I'm in a hopeful phase about it. Well, I mean, I, with reflecting on your question and what you were asking about with regards to another way to think about archive, is that sort of like the, yes, the initial yes. question? Or no? Mm, non-Western. Non no, but 
non-Western ways. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking of examples as you were thinking, you were asking about, you know, what are some of the ways in which it, it is, you know, um, non-Western notions of an archive could exist. And I think even like in the everyday lives of people, like I think of my grandmother in Trinidad, you know, being a seamstress, the dresses that she made and, and, and pants and, and so forth, the pieces of clothing that she made for family and for customers as a form of archive, or even my great uncle in London, he for many years created costumes for Notting Hill Carnival, like, right? I mean, if you've been, I mean, that's like, yeah, and um, maybe even another way to think about uh, another example of an archive is perhaps Beyonce's visual album for Lemonade, you know? I mean, I think there are so many different ways in which we could think about how these these ways of, of, of um, yeah, storing, preserving a memory, right? Um, yeah, Virgil it's possible, Ablo. right? Virgil but, Ablo, you know. Right. To piggyback on this, this note that's been made about memory, cultural memory, let's talk a little bit about the show. So 22 artists from the Southern African region. When we were thinking about this show, Jova, myself, and Josh specifically focused on artists who use lens-based practices as a way to articulate ideas or their concerns. From your perspectives as you know, experts, but then also just people who can see, what, from looking at the show, what has resonated with you? What do you think this show offers the Detroit community, um, the artistic community, but then also specifically the black community, people of color, in terms of thinking about black art as a you know, tool for cultural archive, but then also activating a discourse and conversation that maybe is not salient, maybe it's kind of like happening underground or between us, and how do we expand that conversation to a larger audience? Uh, that's a great question and great point, uh, Larry. I think the first thing that appealed to me, uh, you know, when you and Jova asked about contributing to the show, uh, I was kind of heartened by the fact that it wasn't going to be another show that was specifically about South Africa. Uh, the point being, for those of you who don't know, there's uh, a great deal of uh, artistic uh, kind of production happening in a small, relatively small kind of geographic area throughout the continent in Africa. A lot of production in South Africa. There's some great art schools. The economy has been supportive of it. Um, there are, there's a gallery system, there's academics, there's curators, there's collectors. Uh, we see this in West Africa, in Nigeria in particular. Uh, we see it in North Africa, Morocco, Marrakesh. We don't see it so much in the East, uh, starting a bit, but it's there are no great centers all through the continent, but there's so much production happening regionally in many areas. There's just not um, the documentation and the the you know the envelope that we all kind of look at look for with contemporary art where you have that gallery system so you know artists like calvin dondo being included in the show you know who's in zimbabwe where you know the infrastructure is just not there that guy had to have his photography printed in south africa you know when as a collector when i sent him money to buy work and i saw his work in 2007 at the uh, Bamako Encounters, a pan-African, contemporary African uh, photography festival. When I saw that work, I, I loved it, and I wanted to buy the work from him. The place was so corrupt that even money I sent, like wired, like Western Union, still got stolen, you know? <laughs> it was like, can't even trust Western Union. It was like, damn, you know? So, you know, there, it, it's, it's so tough to sort of get the work out for so many of these artists. I found the show very inclusive. I love that it was gonna be you know, a show that would examine artistic practices throughout the Southern African region rather than many times I'm asked to lend work to shows that are specifically around South Africa where there's an art star system and so forth. So Mozambique and Angola and Namibia and you know, the, the other places have a lot of um, presence in the show. And I mean, that may be a small point for many of the audience who might have lumped it together and said, oh yeah, it's, a, it's an Africa show. But 
you know, it, it, it's a continent, people, and, you know, there's as much difference between an artist from, you know, even in the Southern African region, between an artist in Angola with a whole other tradition and a whole other colonial experience than an artist in South Africa. So, you know, I, I love the, the differences that are brought into the mix with a show like this. It, it, there's a focus, and yet it's inclusive of, of many artistic practices. The other part that appealed was that it wasn't just gonna be work from my collection, but you know, I always wanna learn something. So it was thrilling that you, know, th that you were able to pull, uh, pull in the A4 Foundation and Josh, and you know, there was a great compliment there because I've got a lot of work that's around photography and video and storytelling that way. And then, you know, they've got a real focus with artists like Nicholas Slovo, who's, you know, doing performance. And if any of you were at the opening, there was a beautiful, somber, kind of considered performance from the artist that was, you know, activating his work that you see in the corner back there. And, I, and I'm always excited to see a kind of a mix where, you know, all of these elements are considered, like the many ways that you can kind of tell stories. So the, for the various media, so I think the show is a small show, but, but maybe, you know, there's lots of space in the show, which I think is great. Rather than jamming it all up, there's room to consider things. And I think that there's a very balanced sort of interplay with the artists from the many regions. And it, it feels like this is a better way forward than the simple kind of, uh, and maybe easier act of just going with a, let's do a South Africa show. So that, that was what really appealed. To, to piggyback those points as someone who's done a show at MoCab before, grew up in the region, how important from your perspective was it to situate that show, this show, in Detroit? Yeah, well, ultimately, uh, you know, a show is about its audience, not so much about the content, it's about how it's received and, how, and what it does for you know, that population. And I think knowing Detroit, as I've seen it over the years, there hasn't been so much work from the continent shown here. You know, there really hasn't. It's always been, it's typically been in the context of you know, a major institution like the DIA where in some ways they are presenting work that has kind of uh, already made it in terms of its acceptance in the art market. And, I think you know there's a certain amount of risk taking here, bringing in a lot of artists that maybe people don't know, and I think that's a greater opportunity for local artists and and people who are studying art and art history here to find some synergy and some resonance in the work that you know it, it's not clouded by a cult of personality around the artist. This is like a discovery show. I try to remember that because I know these artists, so many of them personally and you know been studio visits in Cape Town and studio visits you know even in, in, uh, in Angola and I've met some of them before but for most of the folks here in Detroit I think this is a extremely new and enriching experience to sort of you know bring in work and to understand the sameness and the difference about the many artistic practices in that region it's, it's a great thing yeah, I really do love this show and, and the, the selection of artworks, and I'm sure there are probably many more that could have been selected, so I could only imagine the process of deciding which artworks to, to include and what not to include, but I think, um, you know, in, in, I teach a survey course in African art at Wayne State, and the very first class I show a TED talk by Chimamanda Adichie, the Nigerian um, novelist, and it's, it's quite popular, it's called The Danger of a Single Story, and it just speaks about that singular representation, that singular narrative about Africa, this very large continent with so many different countries and histories and languages spoken and religions practiced, but there tends to be, it's such a very one-dimensional like, um, view of Africa and African people that, um, that you know, that, that is very persistent throughout the West, the Western world, and I think this is just a great example of these these beautiful works that just uh, give gives one a glimpse into you know the, the the perspectives of these various artists, and 
you know, different aspects of their experiences, right? Their, their black lived experiences on the continent of Africa and these various societies and countries that are dealing, you know, th their works that tackle various, um, you know, I, in di different forms of identity with regards to like gender, um, sexual orientation, right? Um, yeah, so um, yeah, ethnicity and, and so forth. And so I think these are, you know, very much opportunities for people to, to, to yeah, to connect and to recognize the humanity in these, in these various individuals. And even like in the portraits, right? The photographic portraits. Colleagues, colleagues. Right, right. One, you know, one could see, you know, um, you know, at least have an appreciation, right, for these young people who this photographer is taking images of and, and recognize the, the similarities that they could possibly have with, the, with those subjects. Or even like in the film that the, um, shows the Louis Armstrong visit, I think it was to South Africa, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, you know, and I think that's one of many instances um, you know, for Americans to learn, if they haven't already, the fact that African Americans were visiting and going on the African, to the African continent, you know, and through, throughout history, right? Um, and even certainly, in, you know, in t you know, like I'm, I'm thinking immediately too of the um the 60s and 70s during the Black Power movement and different festivals like Festac, right? <clears throat> Them going to um to many African Americans going to Ghana after Ooh. Kwame Nkrumah right becomes the first Prime Minister and inviting these African Americans, W. E. B. Du Bois living there towards the end of his life. So I think it's just um one you know some really great reminders to of um, for Americans to recognize those linkages, those connections that is not necessarily only associated with a historic past, right? Um, that, you know, where my ancestors came from hundreds and hundreds of years ago, but a very con contemporary linkage and connection and points of intersection. Um, Samantha, I really like the emphasis on the contemporaneity um, and one of the ways in which I think, um, you know, to speak positively, one of the ways in which this is shown in this exhibition is in the emphasis on vernac the vernacular, right? Um, you see people pay, um, praying on, on trains. Uh, you see people at play. And so I think there is, a, and the number of pieces also within rooms that show a vernacular this is a contemporary vernacular. And that much, I think, is really, really um, important to see. I think it's also an opportunity, Ken, um, to think about different, um, you know, we, we've, we've invoked the name of Okwin Wiesa a number of times. And the first, the exhibition that really started to put him on the map, not the exhibition that made him famous, but that put him on the map, was an exhibition with a, based in the, uh, the, the, the Johannesburg Biennial, and it had a really, really good title and concept. The title was Trade Roots. And when I sort of listen to you talk um, about you know, an artist moving between um, you know, Western, Western Canada, Mont Montreal, and so forth, I think in terms of trade routes, there's a kind of cosmopolitanism, but I also think in terms of trade routes. And trade routes do shape cultural practice and cultural reception. So for me, we don't know enough about Angola because we don't know enough about Portugal and we don't know enough about Brazil, even though Brazil is probably going to be the United States in the next you know, 50 to 100 years or so. So there's a whole other, um, not just trade route, but cultural routes there. And our kind of monolingualism um, prevents us from seeing that. But final point, um, because Larry's saying, well, what do we see? All of the things I've mentioned, but here are all three other things that I see. I see power, narrative, and therapy, right? There's a kind of therapeutic dimension. Whether it's the women on the, tr on, the, on, on, on the way to work, on the train to work, who are praying, um, for instance, uh, whether it's the Angolan artist who, with the video of the dollar 
in God we trust. By the way, before the Berlin Wall came down, uh, if you travel to the, anywhere in Eastern Europe, the two most important currencies were the dollar and the Deutsche Mark. Right? Um, so there's another kind of internationalism going on there that is to do. But I see that to do with power. I see the power and the concern with narrative and a therapeutic. And what I mean by narrative is how my, my example of this is the William Kentridge that I rewatched this evening. Um, the, the cartoon, as it were, the, and not the cartoon, the animated piece by William Kentridge. And his title for that is, Let the Drama Begin at the End. Let the drama begin at the end. And it shows a number of animated scenes to do with questions of gender, um, to do with colonial power, as well as to do with basic languages of, so the diction it's a dictionary, right, which is an instrument of the control of meaning. And then within that dictionary are then painted certain images that are clearly to do with colonial instances, but also dictionary of, of art forms, basic shapes of art forms. Um, it touches on the story of Othello, uh, 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 of Desdemona and Othello, and it said, um, if, let's imagine the story from the end. And then right at the end, the last word inscribed across the dictionary is happen, right? So let this, let this story be imagined backwards from the end, as in to begin. Not that we repeat it backwards, but that we can begin a new narrative. And to my mind, this quest, this idea of the new narrative, possibility, which means that things are open, meanings are open uh, in certain ways, is, excuse me, is a way of saying we have to undo certain narratives of power. Because what I see in so many of these works, these lens-based works, whether it's to do with um, gender uh, and the inability for LBGTI communities to reach a certain level of, of visibility, whether it's to do with the power of the dollar, and where the power of the dollar doesn't rep represent America, it represents internal corruption. Right? I see this emphasis on narrative now as let's undo or rewrite the narratives of power that we have inherited. And when I then link that to these moments of meditation, prayer, I see these as kind of a quest for technologies of therapy, right? Within the context of where it is very difficult to undo, unwrite, rewrite, certain existing narratives of power. Those are the things that, that, I, that I see very, very strongly in, in, in this show. Thank you, Michael. So we want to open it up to a couple questions before we wrap up. This young lady over here. <laughs> Hi, thank you all so much for this really wonderful talk. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask about was, as we sort of embrace sort of more socially and publicly this idea of, of decolonization and understanding that there are multiple forms of colonization and there are multiple ways in which we feel colonized as people of color, as, so, like, as, as different members of society, like how, I, I guess, like, I, I, does that sort of preclude like this idea of a singular archive, and does it necessarily suggest a, a multiplicity of archives that we need to understand as like intersecting um, instead of sort of just singular and unilateral? I mean, when um, thank you very much for the question, because when one says, let's say, when I said earlier that for Foucault and Derrida. The archive is in the singular, not the plural. That doesn't mean that there is one archive. It's to differentiate the discourse that archives that we go visit, that's not necessarily what they understand by the archive. But I think if I can respond to your question um, by referring back to a comment that Ken made about the, the proliferation of collecting memorialization archives, 
And that is now a function of our late modernity. It's a function of the fact that we can recover, digitize quickly and cheaply, dis di disseminate. But with that at the same time, so every community now, you know, in, in when, when I um, teach, I, when I teach my Detroit, Detroit class at my college, um, CCS, I talk about the plural histories of Detroit. Um, that yes, Detroit is a, a predominantly black city, but it has only been so for about 30 odd years. And this is a city of 300 years old. And there has been an Arab Detroit for, almost, for over 100 years, for instance. There's been a Polish Detroit. There's been a German Detroit. I find it really interesting that one of the men, George Dan Georgakis, who wrote one of the most important books on black revolutionary politics in Detroit, um, a book called Detroit I Do Mind Dying, which is most people's introduction to the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. Dan Georgakis, who was very well known for that book, also wrote a book called uh, Greek Detroit, <laughs> right? Uh, that not many people uh, refer to. These are archives. These are archives. So one of the things that I think that will emerge precisely because of the technology of modernity is a fragmentation, right? So the problem has been that when, in, when we link the archive to the power, certain powers then are able to exclude. But now, um, the technology of modernity allows a fragmentation of power and alert, uh, permits a dissemination of multiple archives. That then only poses the question, is it that we're going to have lots of archives celebrating local memories, or will we be able to have some kind of narrative uh, that links them, that links that that links them all. So there are going to be more archives, but that doesn't solve what I think is one of the, the fundamental problems, which is that not everything can be can be included, not everything can be included. But we have a technology that allows us, nevertheless, to celebrate um, particular histories, and that is, I think, what we are witnessing with the, with the proliferation of collecting and archives uh, in the way that I think that Ken touched on. Any more questions? I have a question, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know I co-curated this exhibition. Um, so when we were working on the exhibition, uh, Larry, Josh, and I had a lot of conversations. And something I feel like it's important to say is that not all of the artists presented in the exhibition are black or of um, they are of African descent, however, they are not black. Yeah. And so I was thinking about the point that Michael brought up earlier uh, in the sense that this, uh, this notion of an archive being presented through the lens of another. And oftentimes, when I think about photography, both as a maker and as a curator, I think there are lines, very fine lines, especially in the history of photography, and as it relates to anthropology, where oppression, the, the oppression of the lens is very vast and very real. And so going back to what I was saying earlier, that's something that Larry, Josh, and I really were trying to consider when selecting works. And so I'm wondering if, Samantha and Ken, you can speak a little bit about that dynamic within the archive, how there is still this archive of blackness that maybe was not produced by a black person, and what does that mean in sort of this relational power between somebody who's holding the camera and someone who's in front of it? And for a little bit of reference, that image, if you walk into the galleries on the left, the diptych that we made into a diptych, the Kyle Weeks piece, just so you all know, those, those men are holding the trigger in their own hand. So although those are not their photo photographs, they are still in charge. So I'm, 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 do you see what I'm trying to ask here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought it up, Jova. Actually, that's a good example. That work is for my collection. And um, I, I saw that work, uh, I think at an art fair, maybe six or seven years ago when it was produced in Art Joburg in, in Johannesburg. And uh, I didn't know if the artist was black or white, I probably assumed that the artist was black. It actually turns out that Kyle Weeks is white. He's from Namibia, and 
you know, he was tired of uh, kind of that uh, outdated and very typical view of the Namibian tribesmen, you know, from National Geographic with the spear, you know, <laughs> like, uh, you know, kind of uh, always having the, the tribesman has to look a certain way uh, and it's always read in a, in a very sort of specific way that uh, is never giving agency to the, to the subject. So, you know, his uh, idea was, as a, as a graduate project, he was an art student in South Africa, actually, from Namibia, and he decided to put that power, that control in the hands of these young men, the Ovahimba tribe. And, you know, it, it turns out that it's a incredibly powerful and kind of hybrid sort of uh, result. You know, these guys were allowed to dress themselves as they wanted to be, you know, dress as they wished to be shown and to pose as they wanted. And then they had the shutter and they clicked it. So you see this young man, you know, with traditional hairstyle and traditional dress, but also wearing a very contemporary, in the case of one of those images, a Lacoste shirt that he's kind of done this very fashion forward thing by sort of slicing the shirt. And, you know, all of these uh, ideas are super contemporary. It looks like, you know, ends up being work that you could see in a fashion magazine. And uh, there's all these cultural references that are uh, both ancient and completely modern. Like some of the other ones in that series are young guys with their traditional hairstyle and they're wearing like, you know, LA Lakers jerseys. And I just think all of that stuff is, um, you know, really in the end more important uh, than, you know, the cultural identity of the artist. I mean, particularly that gesture, I think it changes everything that he says, you take the picture. But, you know, I have to say, as a collector, what maybe makes my collection different as a black collector, I am much more about the many different stories. Uh, uh, I keep going back to the storytelling thing, which is the the essence of my wedge collection. You know, wedging, wedging a, a sorry, wedging a kind of a space for uh, you know black artists in the contemporary art world. I kind of feel like it's about that storytelling and the many different perspectives. So I'm less concerned if, if it's a black artist, a white artist, an Asian artist, it's a, I don't get too caught up in that. And my collection is inclusive of many different perspectives on black culture. I, I really think that's the only way to go. I think there is a, a certain um, unnecessary limiting that would happen if I'm gonna restrict it to you know only black artists uh, and you're only going to tell stories about black. Well, you know, I mean, I think you can you can hear many different stories, and you can you can uh, kind of learn something. And there, there may be something gained from uh, different perspectives. I think of uh, one of the godfathers of uh, photography um, in the Southern African region is David Goldblatt, who I had the pleasure of spending a day with. He died last year. I had this amazing, memorable day with him and his wife in his home, and. Think, and looking at his personal archive, which was fascinating. He's someone who started the Market Photographers Workshop in Johannesburg, and you know, out of that has come you know, many well-known photographers, Andrew Chubangu, who's in this show, and Zanelli Moholy as well, and many others, uh, Lee Bohan Kanye. And I think that, uh, I'm not saying that these artists wouldn't be there without that start. I'm just saying it's an essential thing that this person's way of seeing and way of teaching is sort of in, you know, kind of pulled into their DNA. I think that there's a certain sensibility that someone like David Goldblatt with his own complicated uh, family history and colonial history and certain oppression that he felt uh, as a Jew in South Africa too. I think these things are all kind of um, uh, important in terms of a certain sensibility that uh, artists uh, kind of can resonate with and there may be more sameness than you think there is what I'm getting at. I mean, when <clears throat> you think about the, the advent of photography as a form of technology and that, that captures, you know, the, the, the real world, if you will, I mean, uh, you know, for, certainly for black people throughout the world, you know, it certainly, it was an opportunity for them to determine, you know, the, 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 how they fashion themselves and present themselves, but it was a vehicle for self-definition, for self-determination. But then on the other hand, 
photography replaced art, particularly in the, in the realm of ethnography, right? And in, in finding a way to document and denote difference, right? To, um, to, to use as a means, as a tool to pseudoscientists, right? Um, that, that would, you know, need these forms of visual evidence to, 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 to prove a supposed inferiority of people of African descent. Right, you know, thinking about the Agizi daguerreotypes and and other um, you know like collections of, of photographs that that really um, you know convey these 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 false notions. So you know, it's it's really it really is fascinating. You know, thinking about these various um, you know like complex ideas with regards to, to identity and with regards to the, the lens, right, and 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 how it often is. Uh, you know, the, the, the as a viewer, you often adopt this. Um, you know, I guess because of social cultural conditioning, this this heteronormative um, way of, of of seeing, right? But um, but 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 still, I think you know, like when we think of of Africans and the fact that Africans are of different ethnicities, different races, and different parts of the world, I think we are enriching our you know, um, experience of black art when we see artworks created by Africans of, of you know, various, of various races. You know, they, they do have their own perspective and a nuanced way of, of conveying the, um, you know, like the, the yeah, contemporary life and you know, their experiences and so forth. So um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it really is an interesting and complex question, but yeah, um, particularly with that artist that you were discussing, you know, these he gave these subjects, you know, ownership, right, and a, and a sense of authorship to of these these representations of themselves. So I think that's really quite um, clever and interesting. Yeah. So with that point, we're gonna have to end. I'm getting the wrap up sign from my colleagues, but thank you, Michael. Thank you, Kenneth. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you for being here. There's, there's one more program that'll be happening on December 5th, uh, States of Flux Zim to Detroit. Uh, that is gonna be an incredible event in partnership with ZCCD. Um, and another point to bring up, the publication is here. This is blood, sweat, tears, joy. Uh, we actually just got it today. Uh, it's available for purchase today in the bookstore. Uh, please get a copy. Uh, there is te a text by myself, uh, Jova, uh, Josh Kingsburg, Pamela, um, our executive director, Alicia, um, and beautiful images from the exhibition. Um, and again, blood, sweat, tears, joy. Uh, please get your copy. Um, did I miss anything? Uh, big big uh, shout out, uh, big shout out to Zeb Smith, who yes. is, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, you gotta give a shout out to Zeb. I'm sure all of you know Zeb's like Mr. Mocad, you know. And uh, we worked with Zeb over a decade ago on the show for my collection here, and it's a thrill to be back with Zeb at Mocad. Um, thank you for all the love that you give uh, and all the hard work that you do at Mocad, Zeb. Thanks, brother. And so, just so you know, last thing, exhibition is on view until February 2nd, 2020, so please come see the show once, two, three times, bring your family, friends, cousins, Thanksgiving next week, come before Thanksgiving, after. That's not the last thing, Larry. The last thing is, we gotta give a shout out to Jova Lynn. Yes. Say it. Shout out to Jova. New curator who's of been MoCat. Curated. Who's been promoted. Gotta say it. Deservedly so. Yeah, take a bow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jova. Passing the baton. Jova Lid. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So with that, thank you for being here. Take a quick lap of the show before you get kicked out. Um, but you can be back again tomorrow. Thank you again. We're happy that you were here. <laughs>